Welcome, everyone, to Public Live. I'm your host, Nora Ali. We are joined today by friend of the app, Mark Mahaney, who is the Senior Managing Director and Head of the Internet Research Team at Evercore ISI. Mark is also the author of a book titled Nothing But Net, 10 Timeless Stock Picking Lessons from One of Wall Street's Top Tech Analysts. We are, per usual, doing book giveaways. So if you want to get your hands on a copy, just send a DM to the Public Live handle. Again, send a DM to the Public Live handle. Lots of topics to get to today from Amazon's acquisition of One Medical to the state of social media to the state of Netflix after they reported earnings earlier this week. So let's get to it. Mark, welcome. Good to be here, Nora. Let's start with the big news of the day. Amazon announcing it's acquiring One Medical for $3.9 billion. So for context, One Medical operates a network of boutique primary care practices, and they also offer telemedicine services. So Mark, we know Amazon has been angling to grow its presence in the healthcare space for some time. For example, it purchased prescription delivery company PillPack back in 2018. What does this large acquisition say about Amazon's future in healthcare? Well, I guess to state the obvious, they are uh, serious about doing something in healthcare. Now, this is this is taking them a step beyond because PillPack sort of made much more strategic sense because it was it's one of the uh, items um, you know retail pharmacy is um, is part of a consumer's household's annual uh, budget. Uh, this takes them into almost the services business. Uh, you mentioned a few uh, key details about One Medical. Let me throw out a few others. They have about um, 186 uh, locations. Uh, they have about 800,000 members. This is a membership model. So the average consumer like us would spend, I think it's a little under 200 bucks a year, and you have the ability with that <coughs> to get um, uh, to, to get same day, to do same day uh, physician visits. I think in the initial documents I saw from One Medical, they said that the average consumer's uh, wait time to schedule a doctor visit is 29 days. That strikes me as a little long, but I'm sure it's not same day. Whereas with One Medical, their promise is you will be able to see a medical professional same day and you can all do it all with an app. So it does sound like they've come up with a, um, a more interest. There are other companies that do this though, but, but, um, but versus kind of legacy uh, medical uh, primary care providers, this does sound like uh, there's a interesting novel approach here. And so what Amazon is doing is buying one of the leaders and it does have a high N- NPS score. Um, it's buying one of the leaders in kind of the, I don't know what you're we're gonna, we're gonna, what we're going to call this kind of this hybrid primary care membership model. It's buying one of the leaders in that space. And uh, and they're showing that they're actually pretty serious about uh, health care, which we kind of knew. But this step uh, certainly you know stamps that. Mm-hmm. It seems to make sense on a few levels, as we mentioned, given Amazon's interest in health care, but also to your point about the membership model. Obviously, that reminds us of of Amazon Prime and Amazon's uh, membership model itself. How do you think this will sort of fit in to Prime? Is this going to be a way for incremental membership uh, and memberships for Prime? Is this going to be a separate service? What is your outlook on how this might sort of fit into Amazon's portfolio? I, I don't know, Nora. That you're you're asking a really good question. I don't think we have any of those kind of details. I, I just um, you know we have a. Um, Analyst here at Evercore, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, who's covered uh, one uh, one medical. So that that's how I glean the insights mm-hmm. that I have into that asset. Um, uh, could um, could one medical be embedded into a prime package? Possibly. You know, it's um, you know as as prime, it could be an additional feature to Prime. There could be a nice overlap in the customer base. Now, I want to put this in context. I mentioned earlier that um, One Medical has about eight hundred thousand paying members, paying roughly um, uh, two hundred, bu- a little under two hundred bucks a year. Although a good number of those customers are actually paid there, it's their employers who pay that. Um, and Amazon's Prime membership program in the U.S. has got north of seventy million uh, customers, so it's a pretty big difference. But is this something that they could embed in the Prime package? Not this year, but like a few years down the road, maybe when the Prime is at a higher price point. Yes, that, that, that's a that's a that's a possible synergy. It's a possible win here. But if I just step back, you know, Amazon's done these kind of acquisitions, Zappos, Whole Foods, Kiva Robots, where they really just bu- try to buy high quality assets at a discount price and then let them run themselves. Amazon mm-hmm. is not a fixer upper M&A company. They don't buy assets and 
you know, strip out all the management team and turn everything over. That's not their style. They don't want to do that. And I think with One Medical, they bought an asset that they can put cash into, and that's it. Let the company just keep running as is. So I just want to put this in context. Look, I like Amazon as a stock, as you know, Nora. It's one of my top picks here. And this has been a very tough year for all growth uh, equities, absolutely. And, and Amazon's fundamentally underperformed year to date. But, uh, you know, I like it for the next play with the improvement I have in the future. I'm not going to buy it. I don't think anybody should buy it because of this acquisition. I would just consider it part of the option value that you get in Amazon shares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee any other tech companies dabbling further in the healthcare space as, you know, trying to diversify away from relying just on ad revenue, for example? Is this something you foresee more M&A perhaps between tech and, and healthcare? Two companies come to mind that could do this, maybe three, Google, Apple, and Microsoft. Um, Google has uh, made a few initiatives in the, in, well, yes, uh, Google has got uh, life sciences companies um, in, in their portfolio and their other bets portfolio. So yeah, th th they've made, they've made, they've shown an interest in the space. I could see them doing more. They certainly have the, the cash to do it. Uh, Apple has, there's been rumors about them getting more into healthcare and, and they have, um, uh, they, some of that would fit in nicely building out the, the utility of their devices, of their smartphones and watches. So, yes, I could see that. And and maybe Microsoft. That's probably the one I have the least visibility into. But but possibly uh, they would do that. Everybody knows that healthcare is a you know huge. Um, uh, it's a it's a huge market that probably hasn't had a ton of innovation. In part because for good and for bad reasons, it's very highly regulated. So um, I, I'm sure it's it, on those on those board and, the, and that chalkboard and all the board members of these big tech companies, they probably have to have every year some sort of presentation on what the company can do in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Whether anybody really wants to go after it or not, I don't know. Sure. Uh, let's move on to some other tech companies. In a recent note to investors, you posed this question: Is TikTok eating Meta's lunch? How much of a threat, and I feel like I might ask you this, some version of this question every time we chat, but how much of a threat is TikTok to the incumbent social media companies that you cover right now? Well, it's absolutely the, maybe the biggest competitive risk that they face. That the, um, the Instagram asset, Snap, Google, YouTube, I think all three of those face, you know, material risk from, um, from uh, TikTok, or at least they're a force to respond to TikTok. And they all have. They've all rolled out uh, short form video offerings, whether that's YouTube shorts, Instagram, Facebook reels, Snap, um, Spotlight. So uh, even Pinterest has rolled out uh, Pinterest ideas tab. Uh, so people have realized that short form video, there's a massive consumer interest in it. That's how TikTok got to over a billion. They're the, they're the, they're the only platform recently that's eclipsed that billion you know, user uh, metric and their ad revenue is growing triple digits, like well over a hundred percent year over year. So there's definitely something there. I'm, my guess is that TikTok, you know, this is um, ByteDance revenue outside of China is going to exceed ten billion uh, uh, U.S. dollars this year. So that's sizable. That would be bigger than Pinterest, bigger than Twitter, and I think bigger than Snap too. Um, so uh, it's. Uh, that those ad dollars and that time spent is coming from somewhere. That's one of the things we do is we actually try to track this time spent. What we've seen so far is that time spent per user <coughs> has continued to rise at Facebook and Instagram. But there would be the there is the risk that at some point TikTok could cut into that unless Facebook and Instagram innovate well enough with Reels to kind of keep their users' attention. And that's the big question, right? Is does, does Meta have the ability to innovate enough with Instagram so it's not just a copycat, a less good copycat of TikTok? I, just before this session, I was watching Adam Mosseri saying on Instagram in a post that the only video format that'll be available from Instagram going forward will just be Instagram Reels. So they're really leaning into Reels. Do you think there is any possibility or advantage for Instagram being a part of Meta and being able to innovate beyond TikTok, or is it just a, a catch-up game at this point? Well, catch-up may be good enough. Um, mm. So I don't want to. You don't. You don't have to necessarily innovate, but at least you got to be able to. Uh, they, they at least you got to be able to um, have table play, pay table stakes, and they can certainly do that. They have the financial ability to do that. But the you know uh, Facebook and Instagram are highly innovative uh, platforms. They have rolled out a lot of feature improvements and uh, in innovations themselves over time. So yes, I think if they execute well, 
they can hedge the TikTok risk, but you know they definitely have had to respond, and they will have to continue to respond. So I, I don't. I think it's too early to make a definitive statement about whether uh, uh, the the um, all of uh, it's definitely part of Facebook's lunch is being eaten. What we need mm-hmm. to figure out is whether that's just the um, that's the that's the, the that's the Twinkie that was in the pack the package, <laughs> or whether it was the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So far, my guess is that they just nibbled at the Twinkie. <laughs> Just the tweak. I love that. So Gen Z is also turning to TikTok and Instagram, not just for entertainment, but also for search. According to Google's internal data, nearly 40% of Gen Z prefers using TikTok and Instagram for search over Google. That was surprising to me. Do you think this is a troubling trend for Alphabet if a lot of people are, a meaningful number of people aren't starting their search in Google? Yeah, that is. So I'm a little bit skeptical of that. Um, of I, I've seen that data point that you just referred to. I'm a little skeptical of it. Um, and then I'd also want to know what I'm sorry. What are we searching for? So, mm-hmm. you know, the the bread and the bread and butter, literally, of Google you know, are commercial searches. I want to you know find baseball mitts. Uh, I want to find um, uh, um, you know uh, places to go. Uh, where are there any? Uh, Houses available uh, mm-hmm. for rent and, uh, you know, wherever, uh, you know, some, some vacation place in the U.S., except, I mean, they're, they're commercially intent driven. Uh, the question I would have is, yeah, but if you look at commercially intent searches, uh, how high are they on TikTok? I don't know the answer to that. I just that mm-hmm. number that I heard and that you rolled up, I, I just I got a little skeptical about it. Yeah. Gotcha. But yes, it, but it, but it, but that would be yeah, would clearly be an issue for Google. Mm-hmm. Sticking with Google slash Alphabet, let's talk a little bit about YouTube. Can you just put into context broadly how impactful this business is for Alphabet and how much of the company's growth potential exists with YouTube? YouTube's a TV for the next generation. At least that's what the pitch has been for the last 10 years. And that's largely been true, although now maybe that changes. But um, YouTube has been, a, uh, you know, I'd say it's about a quarter of the value of the company as a whole. 20 to 25 percent of the value of Alphabet, the parent company, probably can be ascribed to YouTube. So it's cr- it's critical to the it's critical to the company. Uh, it's critical. It's connected. TV becomes a bigger and bigger part of um of the advertising landscape. YouTube is Google's play on connected TV. It's absolutely a key asset for Google. Last topic in question for you, we have to talk about Netflix, which reported earnings this week. As we all know, they lost just, just, huh? They lost 970,000 subscribers, but that was better than the expectation of losing 2 million subscribers. What is your outlook, Mark, for Netflix? Do you think they can reaccelerate their growth? Yes, I think they can reaccelerate the growth. Um, the question is when that'll happen, and and how quickly, how substantially they'll reaccelerate the growth. So, Nora, here are the key numbers. Back in 2019, Netflix's revenue growth was north of 30 percent. That's super premium growth. Like, uh, and they were doing this from a you know position of more than 10 billion a year in revenue. Like, that's you don't see that too often. That's rare air growth, and they were the leading play off of global streaming this year. Their revenue growth is slowed down, and it's going to be, if you adjust for currency, it's going to be like 12 to 13 percent. So Netflix has dramatically slowed, and that's why the stock has cratered so much. Uh, is Netflix going to be able to get back to that 30 percent growth? I think that's extremely unlikely. I think it's because of competition and because of, frankly, maturity in their markets. Netflix is already in well over 60 percent of U.S. broadband households, and I think that's the case in not just the North America, but in many Western European and Latin American Country, so they've they've got competition and and maturity risks here that they're they're dealing with, which means it's just going to be growing much more slowly. And I think they're kind of acknowledging that. But can they still reaccelerate the growth? Yes, because they've got this one GCI growth curve initiative. I talk about it in the book. Then that's an advertising model. Frankly, I think Netflix should have launched this several years ago. Um, you know, this is a bear, this is a really good management team. Wonderful vision. They freaking invented DVD by mail and then streaming. So all kudos to them. But I think they were late in realizing the opportunity around an ad supported offering. But that's all right. We all know that now. The question is the next play. Can they execute well on this? And I think they can. I think they can do it in a way that's positive for revenue and positive for profitability. But we're not really going to know how well they do this until the end of 23. So I refer to uh, Netflix as a potential 24 long, 2024 long. 
but it's possible that the market doesn't doesn't feel like we'll bid it up and hope that this thing will work. You know, the hope trade could take the stock higher. And the valuation right here is pretty darn reasonable. It's like 20, 18, 19 times earnings, gap earnings for the leading streaming company in the world. So that's why you could see some value funds kind of taking a shot at this. Well, we're all anticipating what Netflix's ad supported version will look like. And I'm sure a lot of other streamers will be taking note. But Mark, thank you as always for the insight Thanks, Nora. and for the time. Mark Mahaney is a senior managing director and head of the internet research team at Evercore ISI and the author of Nothing But Net, 10 Timeless Stock Picking Lessons from One of Wall Street's Top Tech Analysts. Send Public Live a DM if you want a copy. All right, Mark, thank you again, and we'll see you next time. See you, Nora. If you would like to see more content like this, subscribe to our channel and download the public app where you can listen to these sessions in live time.